morning, everyone. Um, this is a program that Genentech company I work for. We run because we we understand that, especially an audience like yourself, recipients, um, the clinical side doesn't matter much. Uh, the physicians handle that. But we always have a concern, as you do, how you're going to pay for your medication. And this is a this is a program we put together. It's not clinical. You're not going to hear about any products today. It's going to be, as you can see, the topic here, you know, the existing payer environment. So I hope you'll find this interesting. Um, this is a program we've run in the hospitals for nurses and clinicians, but it really is very appropriate for you as, as patients. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Jalen. Thank you. So we're, we're uh, passing out handouts, and the handouts actually have all the slides that I'm going to be going over um, within the handouts. Please feel free to take notes because those are yours to take home. And um, just to give you a little background about me, I actually work for a company called Extenda, and we are a consulting company partnered with Genentech. And I pretty much, I'm based out of Dallas, but I travel across the country developing material like this and educating providers and um, uh, uh, healthcare professionals and that kind of thing. So um, hopefully you'll find this informative. It, please feel free during the presentation to ask questions. Um, I like to keep these things pretty informative, um, informal, and I know that some of this, this, this deck is really geared more towards providers, but we're kind of catering it. <laughs> um, but I think we're, we're, I think this is really great information for patients as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, anytime I do these presentations, we always have a disclaimer slide. So we have a disclaimer. It's like I call it my housekeeping slide. Um, basically, everything in here is for educational purposes only. The important thing to remember is this material was put together in, um, I believe it was January of this year. So some of the information may, as we all know, healthcare changes all the time. So some of the information may be outdated, um, especially when you look at it about a year down the road. So um, especially, you know, depending on who's going to be president next year, because uh, we do have a lot of information here about healthcare reform as well. So we've got um, a couple of safety slides in here because this is more catered towards um, that with people with foul sight. We've got some prescribing info slides here, which I'm just going to go through box warning as well and then our objectives so um, when we look at the payer market with, um, with with transplant patients and bowel site in general we're going to look at commercial um, insurance as well as Medicare and then within Medicare there's a lot of changes going on there so um, on the physician side there's a lot of things that you guys might be seeing come through that are um, initiatives for, for, for providers that may impact you guys in the future. So we'll kind of touch on this as well, and then we'll look at healthcare reform towards the end. So this shows you kind of a national, like, like a overview about where we tend to see Valside patients based on payer type. So as you can see, the majority, about 40% or 50% are commercial payers. And then we've got Medicare, about 25, and then we've got others kind of that take up the other 25%. As I said, this is a national kind of viewpoint. Now, depending on where you are within your area, geographically, this could be very different. So in some areas I visited, we'll have 80% you know, Medicare. It also depends on the facility. There could be 80% Medicare of patient lives versus you know a higher amount that's a commercial. So, But um, depending on where you are, like I said, this could vary. When we look at commercial, and this is like your Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Aetna, et cetera, they, unlike Medicare, all have different policies. So you can go to a Cigna website, and they're going to have a different policy than, say, Medicare, which usually Medicare has an across the board for a specific region policy, um, which can make it kind of challenging, especially um, from a provider standpoint to understand what all these different payers are requiring for physicians um, based on what their policies state. And um, they may also have, they all have different uh, plans in regards to the prescription benefit. So very similar to like the Medicare Part D plans where each of them are very different. Um, commercial payers are very much the same. They all kind of have different um, 
program benefits in place. Now, uh, one thing you guys probably have seen uh, is a shift mm -hmm. in the industry in regards to patient sharing. So when we look at uh, on a commercial side and Medicare as well, there has been a shift where more of the financial responsibility is being placed on the patient. How many of you guys have seen that? Yeah. So it's becoming a lot more common, unfortunately. Um, so this slide kind of shows you what the shift that we are seeing, and this is between 2009 and 2010, and this is just looking at the prescription benefit. So, you know, when we look at the different tiers that are offered by um, commercial payers on the pharmacy benefit side, there tends to be an increase over the course of the year between the different tiers that are being offered. And this is, goes into a little more depth, as you can see, um, we kind of added in this fourth tier drugs, which tend to be your more expensive biologics, and they have an extremely high copay or coinsurance um, amount associated with them. And then within the other tiers, we've seen a little bit, a little bit of fluctuation. But I, I would say on the overall, we have seen somewhat of an increase in each level of these tiers. How many of you guys have commercial insurance here? Oh, okay, good. And the rest of you are Medicare. Okay. Now this, I always think this this slide is an interesting one because um, you know based on your experience, you probably see a lot of. Uh, prior authorization requirements, step therapy kinds of things. Those are called utilization, utilization management tools. You guys probably see that a lot. You see a lot of that and it's frustrating. Um, I know on the physician side, a lot of physicians find it very frustrating as well. But when we look at the spectrum of different types of disease states, transplant tends to be on the lower end of the utilization management requirements that are being put on by um, different health care um, plans. So that's a good thing. We're hoping we don't see that shift towards this high end. Um, and this could be very drug specific. So maybe a lot of the drugs on the lower end of the spectrum don't require a lot of prior authorizations, et cetera. Whereas for those disease states on the, um, on the high end, see it for practically every drug on the market. Um, but that is what we're currently seeing with transplant services. <coughs> How many of you guys have heard of what specialty pharmacy is? You have? Okay, a good fair number of you. So this slide breaks down when we look at commercial payers, the different benefit types. So on the left hand side, you can see what's called the medical benefit. And that's where you have your physician services, your physician administered drugs. That's gonna all come out of your, pharma, your medical benefit. And on the right hand side, wait, yes, right hand side, you can see the, <laughs> the pharmacy benefit. And that's where you've got you know, your oral medications, um, anything that you would get from like the CVS, et cetera, would come through your pharmacy benefit. Now, the specialty pharmacy is fairly new. I mean, new is in the sense that it's probably been around for about 10 years. We are seeing a major uptake by commercial payers to utilize the specialty pharmacy. And that's really geared towards, um, as I mentioned with fourth tier drugs, that's more geared towards high dollar biologics. Um, and this is a way for for commercial payers to control the costs associated with these high dollar biologics. And sometimes they tend to go through a special <coughs> pharmacy. Now you can get drugs that are both administered by a physician and that could be oral medications that you would get through the regular pharmacy benefit. You can get both of those through a specialty pharmacy. Some payers are requiring physicians and therefore their beneficiaries to go through a specialty pharmacy, some make it an option. So you can either go through the medical benefit or the pharmacy benefit, or you can go through a specialty pharmacy. So some, some of them have the option. We have seen trends where a lot more private insurance carriers are starting to make it mandatory. So if those of you that have specialty pharmacy, do you guys have any of, of, um, of your carriers that are requiring it, or is it mostly an option? It's an option automatic. for you? It was, so it's yeah. automatic for you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, automatic for you as well. It's an option, but it's a, it's a benefit. You get, yeah. If you use a specialty pharmacy, you get three months for the process too. Okay, so in some instances it is financially beneficial. And that is the case, I would say, the majority of the time. Um, is that for mostly like oral medications versus physician 
right. oral okay. medication. And in some instances, if you're if it's coming, if, if you're getting a drug through a specialty pharmacy where a physician would normally administer it, that's where I think the financial responsibility can be iffy. So um, it, you guys might not have a lot of physician-administered drugs that you are uh, that would come into your your wheelhouse, but just as an FYI, that could very well be an issue um, if that were to happen. But I do see your point. Most of the time, it is you do get like a price break for. A certain number of months that you can get prescription. Yes. Question. You've got the commercial and the Medicare. Do Medicare Advantages sit in the middle? Because they're a, they're a hybrid of both. <clears throat> Medicare Advantage adheres mostly, to, very more closer to a Medicare benefit okay. design. And we'll, we'll actually, on? yeah, and we'll, we'll actually have a slide about Medicare that goes over that as well. We'll get into details about that. Because I was just wondering where the bias would be going on that because their origins come out of. They, you're right, because they're they're usually put together by the commercial payers, like Cigna, Health United Healthcare, etc. And I think that they do have they do have to abide by certain um, guidelines for Medicare, but they can still take certain liberties. So I think with Medicare Advantage plans, you tend to see a little bit higher utilization management requirements. So um, probably have to go through more loopholes to get prior authorization, um, and uh, they may have more restrictions on step therapy, so you have to do this before you get access to this drug. Yeah, right now they're pushing real hard on generics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I think that could be where we're headed in general, because when you look at generics, the cost difference is significant. Unfortunately, it's not. That's, that's it, the funny part. They, they switched me from a name brand to a generic, and it, it's not anything like that. It's, it's not any there. different in price. But if anything, it was a little more expensive, wow. just because time went, went along. Wow. You know, drugs go up. Right. Get into the next right. step. But we'll get into that. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Any other questions? So now let's look at Medicare. Um, this slide gives you kind of a breakdown of Medicare benefits. We've got Part A at the top, and that's where you know, so you're automatically enrolled whenever you're enrolled in Medicare with Part A benefits, and that's really the, the hospital uh, hospital side of care. And then Part B uh, is where we're is, is the part that you can actually purchase, and um, it covers physician-administered services and procedures. Now, Part C, as you mentioned, the managed care, uh, they are typically, as we said, um, um, administered by private commercial health insurance carriers, and they generally have to abide by certain Medicare requirements, um, but they do have the opportunity to take a few liberties regards to sometimes making things a little bit more restrictive than we would like. And then at the bottom we've got Medicare Part D, which is prescription drug coverage. And um, I don't know if you guys remember when Medicare Part D first came around and the donor hole, which everyone was very excited about Medicare Part D. It was, oh, we finally got prescription drug coverage. And then you saw the donor hole and you thought, what? I mean, why, you know, why are you making us responsible for this so much out of pocket? And that was kind of a big downfall about Medicare Part D. Now, what we're going to talk about later with health care reform is that they're working on shrinking that donor hole. And um, it's going to be very beneficial for patients who have Part D. We'll go into that a little bit later. So, um, for Bowside, most, of, most people will have, who are Medicare, are going to have um, coverage under uh, Medicare Part D. Now, the important thing to remember about Medicare Part D is that every state has a different number of Medicare Part D plans. And that's very much a state-by-state -state basis. And every year, they can be changed. So like right now, we're coming up on open enrollment for Medicare. And a lot of times, what I tend to see happen is maybe a plan, a prescription drug plan, will be canceled. Like it will, it will pretty much go away for the next calendar year. So the beneficiary has the responsibility of picking a new prescription drug plan. And how many of you guys have had to pick your prescription drug? Is it confusing? Yeah. <laughs> Very confusing. Now, they try to make it easy. So Medicare has a formulary finder tool that you can access where you can plug in all the drugs that you're on, um, and it'll pull up all the plans within your state and what the requirements are going to be for those drugs, what the copay is going to be, is there a prioritization requirement, et cetera. But it does require you to know what medications you're on, 
and to be able to access the internet. Like some people just don't have the ability um, to use technology that well. So that that is somewhat of an issue. Yes. I was going to say that in the past, I know that there has been an 800 number that um, I have found published a few places that you can call in it and, and someone will help walk you through it. And you found that to be more helpful than doing it online? Well, sometimes. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, just for someone who doesn't have who access. Who doesn't have access to it, right. right. Or doesn't know how to do it. Right. And there is a, um, I can't remember what they call it, but it's like a, a guide for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, and it's got, I've made a wealth of information, detailed information about how to get access to, you know, during open enrollment, what are your options? Um, and that's probably something that is like it's like a handbook, and that's really helpful. And that's probably where you would find those. Medicare donors. and you is the name of at least one of the books that, that the government. Medicare and you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's that's what I'm thinking. <coughs> and that tends to have like a wealth of information in it, but you have to look through. Um, and it used to be personalized. Oh, it's not personalized anymore? It's getting less so, and it's online now. They're, right. They're, they're saying, well, we're going to save money, so we're going to put it online. So I was wondering, so they don't send it to you anymore. You have to locate it online. See? That's the well, I think if you insist, they will send it to you, but it's a, it's a generic book. <coughs> okay. No longer personalized, which is unfortunate. I have to, excuse me, one more thing. <coughs> oh, no. It, it's personalized by state. Okay, okay. So it, it is that much of a definition. But it used to be, I could put in me, mm -hmm. and it would give me a separate page that was me. Mm -hmm. And now I put in, I'm from Ohio, and it says, okay. So the These separate page here. that was you, did it have like details about the plan that you were on, what your deductible was gonna be, all that stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's sad that it's not there anymore. Well, the, the website still lets you do it. Right, but it doesn't but, come in your, in your guide. Um, the other thing about Part D uh, that, that can be challenging is, I mentioned, you know, every drug plan is different. So, um, very much like commercial plans, they all have their own formulary. They all put drugs on different tiers. They all have different requirements on step therapies, you know, what you have to take, what you have to take before you can take this drug, which makes navigating Part D plans very confusing. Um, and that's why it's helpful to either call, like you said, call that number to get more detailed information, work with your provider as well. Um, I know that a lot of providers have um, kind of increased their knowledge about Medicare Part D as, you know, out of necessity, and they have gotten very well versed in, um, you know, how to deal and navigate Medicare Part D and, um, and the requirements therein. Um, sometimes they have one person in the office dedicated to that, so that can be very helpful. So this gives you an idea when we look specifically at the foul site. So with Medicare Part D, just like with any other prescription drug plan, you have different tiers. Um, and the higher the tier, generally the higher the drug costs associated with it. That, that the financial responsibility of that drug is being put on the patient. And um, about 80% of the time, foul site is being put on a uh, tier four, which is a definitely a higher copay. Now, with um, with Medicare Part D, the other thing that the one thing that we don't have in here that I think is well worth discussing is the low income subsidy option. Is anybody here aware of that? You're so I'm used by aware of it. You know, yeah. So it, it, it's it's really geared towards um, individuals who have, are at a low income level, tend to be 133 percent of the poverty level and below. And they have the ability to apply for low income subsidy plans under Medicare Part D, and which makes a lot of their co pays significantly reduced. Um, it, it, sometimes it can help with you know, not having them get to the coverage gap in, in, in the donut hole. Um, so it, it just, it's, it's, I know some people necessarily aren't aware of the low income subsidy plan, so I wanted to make sure to mention that um, during this particular. Now, um, yes? I have a question. What website are you looking at to get this information? The Medicare website? Yes, right. so it's cms.gov. And that, that's where I always start. But within cms.gov, there is a Medicare tab. And there tends to be a prescription drug coverage section. And you can click there. Does anybody else have a website that they prefer to go to? Basically, uh, that's today. 
you're probably just as easy to go into Google and put in Medicare and it'll pop up right yeah. at the top because there are so many of these different sites that you won't remember their names even though she just told you how cms.gov yeah. you put it in Google it'll pop right up for you just by the topic And for that Medicare formulary finder tool, I would Google Medicare formulary finder tool. Um, I was able to find it by going to CMS.gov and going to the prescription drug coverage, but you may be able to you know, do one quick search and find it. Like Any other questions? Okay, so with Medicare, some of the things that we're seeing just in Medicare landscape, kind of stepping aside from the reimbursement and policy side, are these, these different kind of things that are happening in the landscape in regards to technology, quality, and auditing. And um, the, the technology side, so something that you guys may start seeing more from your physicians, if you haven't already, is an increase in the ability to access your healthcare online, um, electronic records, then contacting you via email or text, whatever. Um, that's definitely on the increase. They are also requiring, and this is kind of an overall um, initiative by CMS, is to collect data from physicians on quality. And this is geared more towards, um, you know, based on a patient's diagnosis. But they want information from physicians, and the reason why they want it is because they want patient care to increase. At the same time, they're trying to lower costs. So this has been a huge initiative on, on the physician side. Um, the, the two items on the left are currently voluntary initiatives. They are becoming mandatory, which is why you're probably seeing an increase in your physicians doing a lot of electronic type things. For example, their medical records are being electronic. Um, there is an initiative through, uh, through Medicare which is, is indicated here on the slide, um, for physicians to go electronic, they actually get some money. They get an incentive money. And after 2016, if they're not um, adhering to utilizing electronic medical records, they will be penalized. Now, just out of curiosity, how many patients have, or recipients, sorry, <laughs> have seen your doctor pull out his smartphone and, say, and do the prescription right there directly to your pharmacy? Yep. Yeah, more and more. Um, I yeah. think there's an article in the USA Today about this. Um, about electronic, electronic record records? Record yeah. keeping, yeah. Awesome. Well, it's definitely a big step. Now, the one thing that having presented this type of material to a lot of physicians, a lot of them are hesitant to switch because it is costly. Um, a lot of specialties especially are concerned that the program the software that's available to them is not catered to their specialty because every specialty is different. And um, even though there are incentives, there's about there's up to forty-four thousand dollars per physician, per physician in incentives. If you've got a one physician practice, that may not cover the cost of a, an electronic medical record. They tend to be very pricey, unfortunately. So I we do see a lot of pushback from physicians. In addition to the cost side of it they find they can't see as many patients as they used to. Because, you know, when you introduce something new, um, especially with technology, we probably all introduced something new to technology into our lives. It may look quicker later down the road, but in the beginning it's not. So they're, they're definitely going through some growing pains with um, electronic medical record um, implementation to their practices. I mentioned auditing. So auditing, you guys have probably heard a lot about uh, Medicare audits in the news, um, especially in regards to fraud. Uh, this is definitely becoming more and more of an issue. So Medicare has done an initiative where they are conducting a lot more audits on physicians, on hospitals. Um, what you've probably heard in the news is more on the DME side, so like those companies that bill Medicare beneficiaries for wheelchairs and walkers and that kind of thing. That tends to be where we see a lot of the fraud coming up. So they're really cracking down on it. So providers are really having to be careful with um, their documentation because if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So um, this slide just kind of gives you an idea of what the breakdown is in regards to the jurisdictions for auditing and who the different auditors are. And then we're gonna, now we're going to transition to healthcare reform. 
So does anybody have any questions about Medicare, cash <coughs> repairs before we turn? Yes. Um, all this stuff usually makes my eyes glaze in. Yeah. So um, I'm going, if, this, if this question doesn't even make sense, forgive me. Um, sure. But um, at one point, I think it was Valcite, but I could be wrong, but one of his medications was really expensive. Mm -hmm. And then the hospital said, oh, well, we got special authorization. Um, like his doctor said, we got special authorization. Now, I don't know from who or what, but the price, the copay was pretty reasonable after that. Was it, <laughs> what, what insurance carrier did he have? It was Medco, but then it changed. But it came through commercial care versus Medicare? Or was that Medicare? It was Medco. No. Okay. So maybe they came maybe they came from a commercial copay program, the Valsite copay program, very well could be. They do have a um, and this happens with a lot with a lot of um, uh, different types of drugs that you can be on. They usually have some kind of copay program to assist with the cost of the drug. So what would happen is that you would enroll and that particular manufacturer of that drug will assist you by lowering the cost of the medication so that you're not out of pocket so much. They could have also maybe gone through, instead of gone, going through the pharmacy benefit, going through the specialty pharmacy, that may have been uh, the way it works. And sometimes they can just work magic. Throw some fairy dust on there and you're good to go. Magic to my wallet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's great to hear that that happened. I mean, usually, unfortunately, on my side, I tend to hear a lot of the opposite. So that's really great to hear that they were able to lower the cost. Medco has just changed to uh, uh, prescription specialists. Right. Oh, they just changed their name? Oh, no, ours is CVS now. Oh. It's like a CVS thing. They're always changing their names. I, I think mine changed to Express Strips. Mm. Mine just changed again yeah, three times yeah. in one year. I think they're all buying each other up, so all of a sudden, you know, we only have like He's only week. seven months out from transplant. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Welcome to the adventure. Yeah. We've <laughs> <laughs> been pretty smooth so far. Though. Good. Yeah. Good. Where's the wood? <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so, oh, he has a question. Yes, in the back. Sometimes you can go to Canada and get a generic that cost a third. A third? Uh, yeah. yes. How about copay of 169 compared to 52? Wow. Now, is it, does that require you to drive to drive to Canada? Or you can get it the, the mail? Wow. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Anybody else? One other thing I would caution you, I, I made the mistake of uh, being thrilled when my wife moved to a different company and the benefits were no cost, uh, you didn't contribute out of the payroll for the insurance. I said, wow, that's great. Ha! You didn't look at the fine print that said, by the way, it wasn't $35 copay, it was 35% they were gonna pay, you were paying 65%. We went through the, I mean, the first time I was aware of it was when the, the drug company called and said, Mr. Gleason, the credit card you've given us doesn't have enough room on it. I said, you know, what are we talking about? Well, you know, your program. I said, you know, what, what is it, $200? She says, no, it's $3,500. I said, I'm sorry, what? There's been a mistake here. The mistake was the insurance that we accepted and thought was going to pay for all that. Wow. Hard lesson to learn. Don't make that mistake. Read the fine print. Know what you're buying. When it's too good to be true, you know? Well, and to that point, there has been a big shift with commercial payers to what's called like a consumer-driven health plan. And that's like like your, that plan you're mentioning where the, the, the financial responsibility on a monthly basis is significantly lower, if not zero, for the beneficiary. But when you go and look at the benefits, it tends to be a high copay. I'm sorry, not high copay, high deductible. And you're paying a significant more percentage per visit than you would be on a plan where you're actually paying, um, you know, a, like a regular health plan. And those tend to be more geared towards healthier individuals. 
you know, people who don't go to the doctor but twice a year. Um, you know, young, I would say the younger people who, who just, you know, you don't have as many uh, prescriptions that you have to worry about. Um, of course, I was, our younger people in this audience are transparent <laughs> yeah, right. recipients and don't fit that category. Just yeah, so you know that's that. true. We, we recognize that. Um, the, uh, I, I think I had one where it was like a $5,000 copay. I didn't pay anything. And I, you know, I very rarely met it. But it all depends on the individual, as you said. So. But we are seeing a big shift in that. Looking ahead. Okay, so healthcare reform. Um, this is obviously a, a big topic um, in, in the media and in healthcare in general. Um, so we're going to kind of break it down to a couple of different <coughs> topics that affect transplant patients and urban recipients in general. So expanded access to health insurance and the claims administration simplification. I'll probably skip over that because that's more geared towards providers. Um, and then benefit improvements for recipients as well. So when we look at the coverage and expansion side, um, we've probably seen a couple of things happening uh, in, in healthcare in general.